Hey church, welcome to Frontline Community Church Podcast. My name is Cody Mahaffey and I'm the connections and group pastor here at Frontline in Grand Rapids, Michigan. So our mission here is simple, to see zero people unchanged by Jesus. So whether you've been following Jesus your whole life or your journey has just begun, we hope that this message will help draw you near to the person of Jesus. Be challenged and encouraged by his word and be moved to action. We hope these next few moments are a blessing to you and equip you to see who God really is and who you really are in him. Good morning. It is good to be back with you. It's been a little while since I've uh, been here, but uh, it's my delight to be back with you today. I, I, uh, I'm sorry to say I have to begin with a confession this morning. Uh, they say it is good for the soul, and do you have a right to know? Um, I don't like malls. No, no, I really don't like malls. I don't, you know, Rivertown, yeah, none of them, not, not one of them. Now, I, I try not to meddle in people's religion, and I know that for some of you, you know, the mall is like the closest thing to heaven that we have here on earth, and um, God bless you as you go, but not me. I, I'm not a fan of the crowds, I'm not a fan of the prices, I'm not a fan of uh, pretty much any, any, anything about it. I'm the kind of guy who, uh, I just hate shopping. So when I go into Meijer, which I also hate, I, I go with a list. And I like know where everything is. And I go there, 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 and I'm done. And of course they make you go to all four corners of the store every time you're there. And then I use the app to scan my own groceries and get out. So I've had interacted with as few people as possible. Um, yes, I am an introvert, all right? I confess it. I had one lead, uh, person come up to me after the first service and says, look, I, I want to say something, but I know you don't like to talk to people. And I'm like, okay, that wasn't my point. <laughs> I didn't mean to say don't talk to me. That's my point. The point is, it's just like, when I go home today, I'm going to lay down for and sleep for two hours because, you know, people wear me out. But I like people. They're generally fine. You know, they contain many valuable proteins. <laughs> Whatever. So I, I, I tell you what the, the malls are good for. Um, in my opinion, they are good for watching people. I really do like watching people. People are fun to watch. Um, but you know what's even better than a mall? So here's a piece of advice for you, a piece of life advice. What's really better than a mall is um, comic conventions, <laughs> comic cons. Yeah, some of you know... Uh, in addition to my the, the Bellowing of Cain, the book that kind of talks about my journey over the last 10 years, which came out in January, I also have a series of uh, young adult fantasy that under my pseudonym, Gordon Greenhill. The third one's coming out this fall. And so I spend uh, a half a dozen to a dozen weekends a year sitting at Comic Cons at my table hawking wares. Yeah, that's me. And I'll tell you, you get some of the best, um, you get some of the best people watching done. At, at, at malls. Uh, in fact, next weekend, I will be in Lansing at the big Lansing Comic Con, so come see us there. You'll also get the chance to see your own uh, Brian Donahue there. He is also an author and gamer of no small repute, so come and say hi to all of us. Yes, I do love Comic Cons. They're the best. You see the best, the beautiful, the strange, the unsettling. You can find it all at uh, your local Comic Con. So why do I tell you all of this? Why am I giving an advertisement for all this? Well, because today's parable so-called the parable of the tax collector and the Pharisee from Luke chapter 18 is a case study in people watching. That's essentially what it is. I mean, honestly, it's, it's hard to even call it a parable. It's, it's barely a story. Nothing really happens. People don't, like, go places and do things. It's not, you know, casting seed. I mean, the, all the action you have in other parables and things like, nope, not this one. It's merely the sort of thing that you could sit and see just by watching people sitting around. I mean, it is Jesus telling the story, but it is a story. He's telling it about people watching. Because he is telling the story because there are sorts of lessons that you can only get by watching people. Watching people what they do. But I realize now I've already misled you a bit. Because when I talk about lessons... And if there's one thing Jesus is not interested in doing today, it is to give us a lesson. See, Jesus did not tell stories, did not tell parables, say, for the same reason Aesop did. You know, Aesop and his fables with his talking animals and things like that, who lived 500 years before Jesus even. 
See, in Aesop's fables, they're meant to give clever moral tidbits, common sense wisdom on how to live life. You know, do this, not that. Eat this, not that. In fact, if you're looking for a comparable genre in the Bible, your Aesop's fables are frankly more like Solomon's Proverbs than they are anything Jesus ever said. No, 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 no. Jesus told his stories for a much more scandalous reason and a much deeper purpose. He spoke in parables not to make us better, wiser, more virtuous people. If they have that result, hey, good on them. But that's not why he said it. The purpose of the parables, as you may have already intuited from the bumper video, was to tell us what the kingdom of God is like. To tell us what citizens of that kingdom are like. How they live. What they look like. Their taste, flavor, smell. Who are the citizens of the kingdom and what do they live like? And in fact, that's why so many of the parables begin with the line, the kingdom of God is like. It's not a theory of morality that Jesus wishes to put before our eyes today, but rather a vision of the world to tell us a bit of what the world is really like, what's really going on, and most certainly what the world will one day become. So even though today's parable doesn't actually begin with that line, the kingdom of God is like, it certainly is one of those kingdom parables. It clearly is. Because if you go back, we're going to be in, in Luke 18. That's where our parable is. If you go back to the previous chapter, Luke 17, for its context, you're going to find that Jesus is in the conversation with the Pharisees and then his own disciples. And the Pharisees have asked him the question, when will the kingdom of God come? And so Jesus then, in response to them and to his disciples, offers some, some, some rather troubling material on the coming of the Son of Man one day, and then follows it up with a series of parables of which this is one. But Jesus is very clear all throughout the Gospels that he spe when he speaks in parables, not everyone is going to understand. Not everybody really wants to understand. Because if these are, in fact, parables which tell us what the kingdom of God is like and what living inside that kingdom is like, well, then the fact is not everyone really wants to know. Because to know creates obligation. So today, we're actually going to see in this parable some of the differences between those two kinds of people. As Jesus would say, those who have ears to hear and those who don't. He is going to lay before us two kinds of responses to God, two kinds of perspectives about ourselves, two positions in which you can stand, in which you will stand before this day is over. And the choice you make about where to stand is going to affect the way you hear all the rest of the parables in this series. See, the stories of Christ do not stand by themselves. They are one great story telling us about one great reality. So beware. Beware. Jesus is coming for you and I today. Let those who have ears to hear, let them hear. Now, the audience in Luke 18, and this verses 9 to 14 is where we're at, Luke 18, 9, 9, 9 to 14. The audience is kind of vague. In fact, if the passage sort of opens up with this, like, Jesus told a parable to those who think themselves righteous and look down on others. Well, that could be anybody, right? I mean, it could be the, the, his Jewish listeners looking down upon the Gentiles, it could be the Pharisees looking down upon their fellow Jews, the disciples looking up, uh, down upon non-disciples, Romans or Greeks looking down upon the Jewish community. It could, even, it could even be us. As we look down our noses at times on our neighbors, our colleagues, our relations, even our fellow worshipers. Luke is the only one who records this parable, and his placement of it is very interesting, as if to make the point. A parable given to those who think themselves righteous and look down, by other, uh, look down upon others. And you know what story actually follows our parable? The story about the, the children who want to come to Jesus and the disciples won't let them because they're only children. So somebody didn't get it. Missed the memo. But let us do better. 
he who has ears to hear. Let him hear this morning. Like so many of Jesus' parables, this parable is built on what's called a synchresis. That's its, that's its uh, structure. It's a comparison of two opposite things. And you're going to hear Jesus use this, this setup a lot. There are many parables that follow this synchresis pattern. You're going to hear about in future weeks, you know, wheat versus weeds or tares. Wise builders versus foolish builders. Sheep versus goats. Well, this is a parable like that. You're going to have one option or the other. It's also a parable that's framed as if being about prayer. Insofar as the act of prayer is that which is the act which each character performs and really the only action that takes place. In fact, the first line of the parable is this. says, Jesus, two men went up to the temple to pray. But this is not a parable about prayer. Meaning it's not here to teach us how to pray or what prayer is like. I mean, we just came through a series a few weeks back on the Lord's Prayer, which the purpose was exactly that. When you pray, pray like this. That's not what this parable is about. Prayer is merely the mechanism that lays bare what's in the heart of each of the two men that we're going to meet. So who are these characters? Who are these two men? Well, Jesus selects for this story people from near opposite ends of the social spectrum. Remember, synchresis, they have to be opposites. And so he does. Let us consider each of the two men, what they're like, before we see what they do. Our first character who wanders into the temple to pray is a Pharisee. The Pharisees, we actually, I think, have generally a very skewed image of what Pharisees were like. I, I think primarily because of their interactions with Jesus and things never went well for them when Jesus was around. We tend to see them, unfortunately, in exactly the opposite light that they would have been seen by those in their culture. In fact, we use the term pharisaical as a synonym for like legalist, closed-minded person. Person who, you know, puts obligations on people they themselves aren't willing to meet. Hypocrite. We have all these negative ideas for it. And we rank them roughly in the same category as, as politicians. Or at least of the party that you didn't vote for. But culturally, Pharisees would have been highly regarded by the average Jew. They were the religious elite. They would have been the ones that any Jewish listener would have ex been expected to be praised for their religious devotion. It's more like the way you might, you know, you might look at one of the pastors here at Frontline. And to understand, I did not just compare David and Amanda and Blake to Pharisees. That, that wasn't the, the point. Um, and Blake was in the first service and thanked me for not doing so. So that's how he wishes to be identified as a non-Pharisee. But I tell you that to set a kind of a, a point of reference that just as we would expect that if anybody in our midst were to, be, were to be holy, spiritually mature, spiritually faithful, we would expect that if anybody, it's going to be at least one of our pastors, right? Very reasonable expectation. Well, that's pretty much how the Pharisees were understood in their time. If anyone could expect praise for godly behavior, it would have been them. And indeed, we will find out that the problem with the Pharisee is not his good actions, the problem is something else. But hold that thought. Because someone else has come into the temple, back here, sneaking in behind the curtain, our other character, what the King James called a publican. Now, that's a very misleading word if, you know, maybe in Chaucerian English, you know, it, it gives us the image of a bartender, literally the keeper of a pub. Well, that m misleads. So most modern translations won't use this word. They will use it for exactly what it is. In Roman times, it was simply a tax collector. I don't know why the King James goes this way unless they think, thought bartenders were awful people in the 1600s. Maybe. I don't know. But what we have here is actually a tax collector. And that meant the same to the Jewish folk of the day as it would mean to us. Somebody who takes your money against your will. Right? In fact, you can get a sense of how a first century Jew might have thought about tax collectors if you imagine what it would be like to have an IRS auditor show up at your front door. You'd lock it, turn off the lights, and pretend you're not home like it's Halloween. In fact... They were often compared to they, uh, thieves, Roman sellouts, tools of government oppression. 
the Mishnah, which is a very early Jewish commentary on, on such things, actually classified tax collectors in the same category as murderers and robbers. People to whom you are not even obliged to tell the truth. No, we've got no money here. <laughs> so you have very, very different people whom Jesus has selected. And both of these two men were told, go up to the temple to pray. They go up because Jerusalem is setting on hills, right? So they mean it literally. They're going up to the temple. That doesn't mean they're like going to the UP. Now we have to consider each again because the prayers of each of these two men are very different from one another. They are as different from each other as the two men are. So let's go to our Pharisee. Now, I'd like you, before I read, before I read it for you, I'd like you to uh, take note when I read, this is very important, take note of how long his prayer is and how briefly his posture is described. Okay? Brief posture, long prayer. This is what we're told. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men. <laughs> Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even like this tax collector back here. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of everything I have. Well, the attitude of his prayer, this rather long prayer comparatively, is made clear very simply and unmistakably. I am not like other men. It is a prayer of aloofness, separation, and superiority. Note that the error here, the problem, is not what he does. The problem with the Pharisee is not his fasting and his tithing and things like that. In those things, he is simply performing those, that which was required by the Mosaic law. He's actually being a good Jew. And frankly, it's not uncommon, both in Scripture and in secular documents as well, that to have people open up their prayers with how they have obeyed the commands of God. To sort of you know, remind God that I'm doing the best I can sort of thing. You find it all over the Bible. The so-called Psalms of Innocence by David and other uh, writers and Psalms are constantly saying, God, why am I suffering this trouble? Look at what I've done for you. Or Job, he spends the whole of his book defending his, his character on the fact of what he has done. In fact, you're going to find before this chapter is out even, before this chapter is done, you get this, this nice story of the, the, what we call the rich young ruler, this guy who comes to Jesus wanting to know how to be saved, and his entire defense rests upon the fact that he has kept the commandments. The problem with the Pharisee is not that he was zealous about keeping the commandments and obeying God. That would be a mistake. It is always a good thing to obey God. That is not his problem. The issue here is clearly not what he's done, but something that is going on inside his heart. More specifically, what kind of worshiper he thinks he is. The error of the Pharisee is surely has to be that he thinks he can be obedient to God, keep the law and do all this, and still have disdain for people like that tax collector over there hiding in the shadows. So it may have started as a very legitimate affirmation that he's kept the covenant. He's been a good Jew. Has now devolved into disdain for others and self-congratulation. At its essence, it seems to have at it the idea that, well, God should bless this man because it's what, well, it's simply what he deserves. As if his prayer were, were, were to be summed up something like this. Look, God, I'm not like these others. So dear Lord, give me what's fair. Bless me. I deserve to be blessed. Now, the difficulty with a prayer like that is that it really only works if the first line is true, if you're comparing yourself to people worse off than you are. Otherwise, it's not so impressive. Well, the comparison between the two now becomes complete. If we, if we turn around, if we let the camera pan back into the shadows of the temple, you will find there our publican, our tax collector. Now, in reverse, I'd like you to note here the contrast how many words are used to describe his posture versus how brief his prayer is. He is the inverse of, the, of our other man in, in every possible way. It says here, but the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner. 
He stands at a distance, as if, as if ritually unclean, like he, he's not even supposed to be there, like he knows he is there without rights. In fact, the prayer even has sort of strong sacrificial overtones, as if he's saying something like, you know, Lord, the sacrifices that are taking place in the temple right now that the priests are doing in there, let them count for me. Let those be my sacrifices. He stands at a distance. His very presence there in the temple is an act of faith. He doesn't belong. And he knows it. But he embraces the fact that God has offered forgiveness. And as a result, he comes to the temple enduring the staring eyes the mocking smiles, the insults, the abuse, to stand off to the side, in the corner, believing that God forgives and that he wishes to embrace God forgive, God's forgiveness on God's terms alone. Unlike the Pharisee who compares himself to other men and seems to come off so favorably, Boy, this man knows better than to engage in that kind of folly. He himself, he is the socially forsaken one. He is the point of comparison for the Pharisee. The Pharisee even pointed at him. He is the marginalized, the forsaken, the hated, the abandoned. He is the unredeemable sinner. All men look down on him, and in their eyes, he is hopelessly lost. But he knows in his heart that there really is only one whom he has ultimately failed. So he does not say, as the Pharisee does, oh, I'm not like other people. In essence, he prays the only thing a sinner can pray. No, no, I'm not like other people. I'm not like you, God. Be merciful to me. Be merciful. His cry is not for his just deserts, for he knows what that will be if it is given. And it's not pleasant. His cry, rather, is for mercy. The Kyrie eleison, Lord, be merciful. The only truly honest prayer any human can ever pray. Now, here is why this stands, as I mentioned earlier, as such a foundational parable, foundational story to understanding all the other parables. See, I have to confess, I spent um, a lot of my life sort of thinking about Jesus' parables and thinking that the purpose of the parables were to bring me comfort. You know, sort of lift me up. I mean, after all, I'm a follower of Jesus, right? I'm one of the good guys. So Jesus offers his parables as ways of sort of encouraging me by highlighting all the sort of the wickedness and the ugliness out there. But I'm on the inside. It's all good. And yet, the older I get, turned 50 this year, didn't like it. I want to get my 40s back. Never thought I'd hear myself say that. The, more, the older I get, the more I am forced to concede what a mediocre disciple I actually am. How frequently I realize now that Jesus was not siding with me. He was critiquing me. See, we, we, we Protestant evangelicals, okay, that's, that's sort of broadly, roughly the tradition that Frontline sort of has kind of moves in. And we get so used to our doctrines of salvation by grace through faith alone, doctrines of sanctification, perseverance, etc., etc., all right and proper and good as they are. And then I find myself shocked that Jesus is unimpressed and uninterested in my doctoral formulations. How could he be? That he speaks to all people, even his own disciples, as if the choice to follow him is ever before us. Not a choice that I made some point in my past, in my childhood, or my adolescence, or my college years. But now, here, today, that the crucible of discipleship is born today or not at all. 
that repentance, faith, obedience are not merely a feature of my testimony from years past. They are the demand that rests upon me now. That the warnings of Jesus are not directed to the person I once was before I got saved. But they are relentlessly aimed at me here now, today. Right now, in the midst of my current spiritual apathy. My recurring religious resistance. My present pious pride. Jesus often speaks at us more than for us. And the church, I mean here the Church of Jesus Christ, capital C throughout history, has in its best moments always known that the cry, Lord be merciful, is not merely the cry of the unconverted sinner, it's actually the cry of the most converted saint. Have you ever noticed that many of the people in, in church history in the world that we think of as, as most sort of holy in history, those who are known for their deep and abiding love and obedience to God, people like St. Augustine or St. Francis or Thomas Akempis, John of the Cross, Catherine of Siena, Bunyan, Luther, Wesley, that all of these greats of the faith, the holiest among us, are exactly the ones who seem to talk most about their need for mercy. It's almost like, if I can give you like a little picture, it's, it's almost like the closer you get to God, the closer you get to divine holiness, the more glaring our sin gets, not the less. The more heinous we realize our rebellion actually is, the offense it actually causes. It's only those who are really, really far away from God, don't care, aren't interested. Well, they can think themselves just fine, but I guarantee you, you get into proximity of divine holiness, just like Isaiah, you're going to come off your feet. Lord, have mercy. And I mean it, Lord, have mercy. mercy. I turn 50. And so it is. The closer you get to God, the more you tend to think about these things, not less. But I don't want to end the parable here because this is, ultimately this is not a parable that's intended to move us to despair. It's not just a warning. It's not less than that. But it's more, quite the contrary. This is also a parable about hope. Listen to the last line of the parable. Last words, Jesus says on it. I tell you, this man, the publican, the tax collector, the one standing in the shadows, that man went down to his house justified rather than the other one. This parable actually ends with hope. That the hopeless man can and will be justified, can be reconciled to God. This parable is ultimately about the lavishness of divine forgiveness. And the only condition that is here mentioned upon which that justification rests is that we are simply honest with God about ourselves. That we stop putting on the pretenses and the masks and recognize that it is divine mercy we need, not divine fairness, justice, what we really deserve. Who of us could abide that? We can be forgiven, justified, restored, made whole, not because we are virtuous, but because God is merciful to all who ask. So this parable invites us to lay down all the ugliness, the shallowness, the banality that makes up our lives. Lay it at the Father's feet with the confidence that in this posture, God will be merciful, faithful to give us not what we deserve, but what we really need. Friendship, life, a new beginning. The Apostle Peter would many years after this write words in, in his epistle where he would remind us of this. He would say, you know, remember folks, you once had not received mercy, but now you have. 
You once weren't even a people, but now you are the people of God. That is the point of this story. To bring us before the throne of grace in humility and need and find that God is sufficient, faithful, and good. As the worship team comes to prepare us for our final act of worship together, I would like to remind you that it is in this spirit, with this knowledge, and with this confidence that we dare approach the Lord's table this morning. We come as supplicants seeking mercy, not justice. Now, I know that is... That is overly dramatic and a bit sober. But you know what? That's me and my melancholy self. If you want the, the sober, plain truth, talk to Denise, my wife. I'm the weepy one. Like, I'm the one who, like, loses it and things like that. Like, I'm, you know, me and Hootie, the blowfish, you know, the dolphins make me cry. That's me. That's me. So I want us to, to come... Not overly dramatic and sober, as is by want. It is true the Lord's table does remind us of what we once were and that ever will be sobering. But that is not all it means. It cries out to us a more important fact, a greater and more magnificent truth that we, just like our publican friend, come into this house and are justified. We come no longer as paupers and outcasts. We come as sons and daughters, beloved children for whom our Heavenly Father has dared great and terrible things to bring us home. We come rehearsing together the story that binds us together, the story of having once been alone but now being a member of the community of the redeemed. That is why we call it communion. Because we commune not only with our Lord, but with one another, the people of God. We do this together. And so we invite you, O people of God, to come to the table of plenty and with great joy. There are four different stations. There's two up front, and just like American Airlines, two in the back. You're in the closest communion table, maybe behind you. The part that's different this morning is when you go, you're going to take the cup, you're going to take the bread. There is gluten-free available, if that's your want. Don't, don't consume it there. Take it back to your seat. We're going to wait for everybody, and then we're going to commune. We're going to do it together. We're going to be in communion and in celebration of our common life in Christ. So brothers and sisters, please stand. Rejoice, for our Lord and Savior has prepared a feast for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. We hope this message encouraged you to know who God is and who you are in Him. If you want to take a next step, visit frontlinegr.com next. We look forward to connecting with you there, and we'll see you back here next week.